A little nervous because Mike Crack was talking about upgrades. My brain just fizzled. <laughs> But I don't talk about the, the ones with the things from the trees. Please, no rain. Please, no rain. Are you just naming everything? You're classy. I'm just saying things from Canada. My crack has the best team principal name in the sport. Oh, it's just fun to say. As a human. Oh, it's so much fun to say. Mike Crack. It's just like mean girl. Say crack again. Crack. Like it's so fun. <laughs> Not even about insane delay. It just ruins the strategy. Unless you're in Monaco, I don't want rain. I, there's one that I just really want. I know. I'm gonna. I'm gonna keep it where it is. I think you should go yep. with your gut. Yep. It's not. You no. Know, well, my gut is is so torn in half. Well, then that's not your gut. That's your brain. Is it? No. I don't believe that any part of my body can ever 100% make a decision. So my gut is also split in half. I want our decorations to go back up at the end of this weekend. When I was popping a bottle of champagne and we were dancing around at the start of the podcast. Cole and Brown are lined up on the grid. It's lights out and away we go on this week's grid walk. Nicole, somehow, are, you were able to pass germs through the computer. And we thought we were in the clear and everything was back to normal. But now I'm sick. Yeah. So if I sound different, or if you see me muting to sneeze or cough, that's why I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just, I'll fix it in the edit, but I'm sorry to the YouTube watchers. Your sympathy's sick. You're just, like, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's just like a little bit delayed. But thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I apologize <laughs> that you are sick, but I, I appreciate you being here and still recording. Of All course. the things that we have to do today and discuss because F1 never stops. <laughs> but to anyone listening or watching, if you see a glaring mistake in the edit this week, please just don't tell me. Just don't tell me. It's not there. You don't see yeah, it. Yeah, it's cold. Close medicine. your eyes and then yeah. it's gone. It's great. Uh huh. <laughs> we might have a really unhinged edit this week because cold medicine. So who knows? <laughs> but. We do have actual F1 stuff to talk about. We have the Canadian GP this weekend. Lance's home race. Maple I'm syrup. excited. He's getting that maple syrup. He won it. So we're going to preview Montreal, basically take a mood check. Last week we were celebrating Mercedes. Do we feel as good going into this weekend? I don't know. Then we're going to do our predictions for the week. And then we have a really fun segment where we're going to be pitching broadcast ideas for alternative broadcast streams you know such as uh, one that's happening this weekend like uh with a certain daniel ricardo so you'll get to hear nicole squeal in excitement essentially all her thoughts about the oh what is it actually called i the just keep wanting to call stand. it the grandstand i just keep calling it like f1's manning cast because <laughs> that's manning what it cast. is <laughs> yes. it is um so a lot to get into let's go talk Montreal. Let's go to Canada. As those watching on YouTube can see, which by the way, if you're not watching on YouTube, I would recommend it. It's it's a pretty good show over there. You get to see our faces and how we react to each other. While you're over there, you can hit the subscribe button, et cetera, et cetera, all the things that everyone says. You can right now guess how many fingers I'm holding up and then go find out if you're right. Nice. Oh, <laughs> well, last week, our shots were unbelievably celebratory because we were celebrating the Mercedes, what felt like as much of a victory as we can get this season. We're back to some basic backgrounds, which I also feel, at least for me, is representing like the stoic optimism I feel going into Montreal, where I'm like, I don't feel super convinced this is going to be fantastic, but I haven't pulled all the way back. How are you feeling? I'm very much trying to remain neutral, but I would be lying if I said I'm not concerned with whatever Aston's coming to this weekend. Um, they made it very clear that they were surprised at what Mercedes showed up with and how they were able to perform. And I think Alonzo is like gonna be screaming and not as peaceful on radio if they're not able to compete this weekend. 
So I think there's something coming. So I'm trying to, I'm trying, yeah, remaining neutral. My background's a really great representation of, I'm just being like, okay. Like, it's not like I've lost hope, but I'm trying to be realistic about my expectations going into the weekend about what can come. Because at this time, we don't fully know exactly what Aston's coming with. We just know it's their biggest upgrade probably thus far. Yeah, and likely to be their biggest upgrade of the season. Their quotes last week actually make me feel less worried about their upgrade this week because this is an upgrade that's probably been in the pipeline for two months. And if they were feeling cocky about it being competitive with what Mercedes showed last week, I don't think they would have sounded so worried. I just can't forget, like, watching the, like, first three races and being like, Aston, how did... Where, how did they do like just the and like the discourse of like they're fighting with Red Bull and like all of it coming back I just have kind of like this residual fear of like okay I don't know what's gonna come in this weekend and I wasn't expecting like that kind of battle at the start of the season so like again it's the neutral trying to go into but I I'm I feel like I'm definitely a little bit more nervous than you are but I'm just I'm an anxious being I think this weekend's going to be harder because of the characteristics of the track for Mercedes, or more specifically for Lewis, aka my rooting interest. But I think one one thing I feel really strongly about is that Ferrari doesn't know what's going on. So in my head, like that's like one less thing to worry about until I'm t- until Ferrari proves to me that I need to worry about their car on a race day. I will just not think about it. Is what I've decided. Yeah, that's 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 really fair, and I think that was kind of like the basically after lap like what four or five of like Spain, it was just like Ferrari was not part of the conversation. It was just you already kind of were going in with only being able to talk about Carlos and whatever upgrades they brought, like did not assist in anything at all. So who knows what's happening with them? It just kind of feels like it's all like up in the air, thrown upside down. And yeah, that's kind of also as I'm going into this weekend of like Ferrari has not given me reason to include them in this like grand discussion. Just like, will you be able to function properly? Question mark. We don't know. (laughs) Well, this is going to be a really different race circuit. And I think if we're boiling this down to the top teams, we have to look at the race circuit and more specifically the tires. So do you want to get nerdy for a bit? Oh, please. There's just something about a Pirelli tire graphic, like this infographic every week just, wow, hits different. It's so beautiful. This is last week's. They upgraded the graphics for this oh, week. Wait until I click on that one. But I wanted to look at last week. So again, if you want detail, a visual guide to what we're doing, YouTube. Um, If not, we are looking at the Pirelli preview graphics that they put out on all of their social media. So feel free to just pull it up separately. Um, Okay, so the biggest thing here, like really what we're looking at is, and what this weekend will tell us for Mercedes, because I'm gonna look at everything through my Mercedes filter, is how circuit specific was Mercedes performance last week? Barcelona is known as it's the test track because it is the like one of the best tracks, if not the best track on the calendar to evaluate aero performance. So it has all these like really flowing sweeping corners. And especially now that there's no chicane, it's pretty much all flowing sweeping corners, except for like turns one and two. Um, And then you'll notice on their graphic, like how much like abrasion and then like lateral and tire stress are on here, they're full fives. So that's why Pirelli brings their hardest compounds to Barcelona, because it's a high tire degradation race. That's essentially what all these things are telling you. Very fast corners, high degradation, like. I'm not going to use the right terms here, but essentially track, not nice to tires. (laughs) Track makes tires go bye-bye. Right. 
And so we, it's not shocking that Ferrari had a rough weekend, upgrade no. or not. Well, actually, all it told us is that this new upgrade does not fix the problem of their like their car just eats its tires. Mm -hmm. and that's been a problem it's had since the beginning of last season, like this entire regulation set. That's been Ferrari's issue. That's why if you're ever like, oh, why is Ferrari fast on a Saturday? Sometimes, right now, sometimes. But even last year, like they were always fast on Saturday and then they couldn't keep up in the race. It was eating its tires. So it, if you eat your tires, then you can't do as fast of a lap time as the Red Bulls. You're slower. There you go. <laughs> That's uh, tires 101, essentially. Mercedes has been great on its tires. It's actually the only good thing about I could probably say about the W13. The 14. awful, awful dub. No, I was talking about last year. Oh, right. I was talking about last year. No, I, fair point, because why would I ever bring up the W13 again? No, I literally was a little triggered because she said it. I was like, I thought we weren't going to talk about it anymore. I thought it was gone. I thought we were done. <laughs> So really the shocking thing from last week is that how much Aston struggled to not eat its tires on the circuit. So I'm going to flip over to this week. Dun, dun, Look at how pretty dun, dun. Pirelli's new graphics are. Oh my gosh. No, really, if you're not looking on YouTube, you're really missing out because this there's a car diagram. Right. And it does such a great job of visualizing the energy that's going into the tires on the front and the rear. And you'll notice it's mostly green. And that's and then if you just look at their little like one to five graphs over here, you'll notice that the tire stress is a three. Um, overall, everything here is it's a it's less harsh. Less load, I, I believe is the right technical term, is going into the tires. So if you're Ferrari, you're like, Phew, we might not sink like a, to like a ton of bricks. And if you're Aston, you're like, okay, I could probably keep up with Mercedes because this built-in advantage in this Mercedes car is just going to be less evident on a circuit set up like Montreal where you have these long straights and then you have more hairpin corners versus these like high G4 sweeping corner things. things. Yeah, that, yeah, you know. The hairpin's insane. I mean, I I love the Montreal track just for like yes. the possibility of it, but right now I'm a little nervous. The third thing I'm gonna share here, it's hard to do because they're constantly changing the cars. And we're also in the core of major upgrade season. So to your point, like who knows, like Ferrari expected to bring this big upgrade and didn't expect it to go as awfully as it did. So who knows what's going to happen with Aston's upgrade? Who knows how Mercedes upgrade is going to behave at the circuit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what I will look at is I'll look at other circuits that have similar types of corners and layouts to the track this week. And then I'll also look at other circuits where Pirelli brings like the same range of their tires. And I try to use that to estimate performance. This weekend, we have the softest range and the other races where they've brought that so far this season is Baku, well, Imola that didn't happen, and Monaco. And Monaco's Monaco, so we can throw it out. Yeah, it's <laughs> but, like, well, it's, that's literally my brain looked at that. I was like, cool, so can't, necessarily count this for anything <laughs> right so if you want to get an idea of i uh, know i don't think i don't think baku and canada are like perfect comparisons on like at the end of the day none of these are perfect comparisons you're just trying to pull together as much data as possible to make like a decent assessment which is what i'm trying to do here uh, but i would say baku are probably like races I would look at if you wanted to get an idea of, okay, how's Montreal going to go? I am still really confident in the upgrade and the pace differential last week that I don't think that's just going to fall away. My brain's like, okay, cool. That's also how I feel. So whenever <laughs> Brianna tells me data things that it's like, okay, great. These are conclusions that I felt. So I sometimes don't feel that I'm completely out there, but again, I'm in the neutral space. There's possibilities. There's areas of where Mercedes can excel and find if, if the opportunities are there and 
Lois <clears throat> or George takes advantage of them. It, you know, we can, we can, we're here. We're not, it's not going to fall back. It's not going to fall away. It'll be, I feel like we're in for some good racing is kind of what I'm excited for. I feel like we're going to see some things happen today. It'll be interesting to see if anyone, aka Red Bull, pushes for just like a one stop because they'll just have such a gap. But having a little bit of a two stop could create a little bit more of strategy, even if it is pretty consistent in what everyone uses. Just having the ability of like considering a two stop, you know, there's some excitement there just in that. I, there's one that I just really want. I know I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it where it is. I think you should go yep. with your gut. Yep, it's not. You no, know, well, my gut is is so torn in half. Well, then that's not your gut. That's your brain, isn't? No, I don't believe that any part of my body can ever 100% make a decision. So my gut is also split in half. <laughs> you could do the trick where you flip a coin. And you like, you know, when you flip a coin and then you instantly know which one you like, you assign one to heads, one to tails, and then you instantly know once it's in the air, like which one you want it to land on. The amount of times I've tried to do that, but then I never like, I just feel like whenever I flip the coin, I just hear screaming. Like I don't hear an answer. <laughs> I just hear like, ah! Because <laughs> I want that to be true. I remember the first time I heard that, it's like, that's great. I'm horrible at making decisions. Flip coin, screaming. Anyway, <laughs> we're <laughs> going to do our predictions for the Canadian GP coming into this weekend. And of course, I always love to start with our most surprising pick of the week. P1, who do you have? Oh, you know, this week I went with Chaco. No, I'm just kidding. I went with Chaco. I was going to close I know, I saw your face. Hair. I was like, there's no way, unless she knows that Max has, like, food poisoning on Sunday and is manifesting that happening, like, now, and you're just going to, no. Yeah, I also have Max. We have Max. It'll be Max. It'll be, like, a Red Bull 100th win, whatever. Oh, I forgot. Oh, oh. I know. Prepare yourself. Bring it up. Bringing it up to prepare yourself. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't even, like, I did not have it in me to, like, keep it like to say check with a straight face and not immediately redact <laughs> i just even yeah. you getting to actually i was like no like the the craziness yeah. in my brain i was like she's kidding right, right, yeah, right, you... right. it was enough that it made your brain fizzle which like i you know joke achieved you did it you did it <laughs> Woo -hoo. uh who do you have for p4 <sighs> okay so i am so behind the... No, all of them. All of them now is where I just don't feel good. AKA all of my picks, I just don't feel good. But I just am going to lean into it. Because of everything that I think has happened this weekend and the current state of affairs, my P4 is Checo. Oh. Yeah, that's a really, really good one. I've gone through a lot of what Aston's I think could maybe go play and I'm not I don't want to say anything out loud because you and I have different manifesting juju it's what Mercedes I think could be places and just given Checo's like recent what he can do in the car like I just I've recently haven't necessarily been crazy impressed but I don't think he's just gonna like disappear and have as many issues as other times unless something else happens so I have Checo at P4 my shock is that I didn't even process like, I forgot that Checo existed when I was writing down my <laughs> predictions. Like, I, because normally what I do is I, like, loosely mock out my top ten and then, like, figure, like, I in ranges. And of I course. didn't I, I blame You're it sick. on the fact that I'm really sick. You are, no, okay. 100%. That is, this is, like, if you ever needed a sign that <laughs> Brianna is definitely sick, it is that exact Thing. But he also really has not been in the conversation. No, we have to talk to great pick. Echo in a minute. So, yeah, that's 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 where I'm at right now. Yep. Who do you have in your P4? Alonzo. He was the first P4 I put this morning. I was like, you're going to think you're going to get there. Yeah. I feel like I put Alonzo in P4 every week. <laughs> um but yeah, I just, I think Alonzo really likes Montreal the same way that Lewis really likes Montreal. And if he, it was raining, but he did amazing things last 
year in an Alpine and the Aston is definitely better than the Alpine was last year, like in term, especially at this point in the year. So, you know, I said a lot of nice things about Alonzo moving on. Who's your P7? I know. I'm like, really, let's get you back into bed with more medicine and sleep to nurse you. <laughs> My P7. Okay. This is the one that's really driving me crazy because I just cannot figure out where the heck any of Either of these drivers are going to fall. I have Carlos in my P7. Yeah, I do think there's like a muddled group in the middle that is um, like Lance, the Ferraris, and the Alpines that I just kind of have like, it's so volatile right now that I don't really know what to do with it. Yeah, it'll just depend on quality and however, whatever tire strategy everyone ends up going with. That's really how I felt, which is why I've been so back and forth. But I was like, I need, I can't abandon Ferrari immediately, which is, you know, me being any sort of loyalty to Ferrari. That's, this is the pain that I caused myself. So I, and I didn't put Charles just because we're going to step away from the fever dream slightly. And I put Carlos. (laughs) I feel like you say that every week. I feel like every week you say, I want to put a Ferrari driver and it hurts me too much emotionally to pick Charles. So I put Carlos. That is verbatim. Like I think I could do a super cut of all of our predictions and you saying that. And it's fair because it's either been a Charles mistake or a Ferrari mistake in all of the races except one this year. Who is your P7? (laughs) Well, I am manifesting better for Lance, so I didn't pick him. I'm, you know, I gave away that I had this like grouping that I was picking from here. So I, I thought I would put out in the world that I would like it to be Esteban Ocon this weekend. That's, yep. Yeah. As, I would love that for SD Bestie. That would mean so much and show so much of his performance to fall P7 amongst this, like, mess of things. I'm, I mean, we haven't talked too much about it, but it'll be interesting to see where Alpine falls amongst all of the things happening coming into this weekend because they definitely, you know, they're like right there and in a lot of the conversation in the discourse, it's kind of like Red Bull, Mercedes, Ferrari, Aston Martin, and Alpine. And like, it's, they're thrown in there because I think it just needs to see a little bit more of like what they will do and also like Pierre to like stop causing penalties and crashes or whatever. Like, yeah. Yeah, like name, take your pick. Thus, Esteban's the good pick there, yeah. Yeah, I I think, to your point, there's this collective feeling of Alpine could be in this group. Like, Al, it could be this four-team tier below Red Bull, but like if you looked at their pit stops from last week, which is not something I actively watch during the race as the Alpine pit stops normally, it is a disaster. Like, even like operationally between everything Pierre, Pierre is like actively trying to not have good weekends. Then Alpine can't seem to get it organizationally together. And it's really frustrating because I feel like all that's clouding around like what is the actual pace of this car? So I, I think just as much as we can say, it feels like Mercedes could inch ahead of this group a little bit it feels similar on the other end where it feels like Alpine can inch their way into this group. I just, there hasn't been, and I don't count Monaco when I'm talking about like pace groupings of cars, I just chuck it out. So who knows? And I'm, so it's, I don't know. It's interesting, but I want Esteban Ocon to, I just want him to have a good weekend. P7 feels like a good weekend. Yeah. And I mean, spoiler diving into it. My P10 is Esteban. Like, Mm -hmm. for all of the reasons that you said, I really wanted to have him P7, but my brain was doing the math of the Red Bulls and the Mercedes and the Ferraris and the, like, doing that, like, that kind of math of just, like, Mm -hmm. I want him in the points. I, given this track and where it is, I feel like we're going to see action from Pierre and, like, a wall or something, just given how the track is set up, so I didn't want to put him and I just feel like where it could fall, and I want SD Bestie to remain in the points. He's been having a really, really great time, and I know we can't look look at anything from, you know, pace-wise from Monaco, but SD Bestie's on the podium, baby. Had a pretty solid week in Spain. 
hoping that can continue with everyone bringing in upgrades that he can at least remain in the points. And again, I will say it now, as I said in the past, I will have him as my P10 and maybe it'll manifest higher and my heart will win, but my points will lose and that is okay. Who's your P10? My P10 is Piastri. Okay. McLaren is back in the conversation, at least in this discussion we have I don't remember the last time if ever we've discussed them we've in, picked in a, picks yeah besides I, yeah, yeah I mean well spoiler my best of the bottom five teams in the constructor is going to be McLaren this week so I felt like I needed to put a McLaren in the points and I think he's Piastri has been quietly doing a really good job this season keyword quietly like very quietly, quietly. And of most recently in comparison to how they were at the start of the season. <laughs> well, yeah, I wasn't actually even referencing on track results because McLaren is such a all over the place dumpster fire right now. But I just I think he is like his racecraft has been good considering the circumstances. I think he's really like getting on with the weekends. He's been showing signs in qualifying of being able to compete with his qualifying specialist teammate and you know i my p10 is always for like what kind of like good vibes do i want to put out in the universe if someone deserves points this week and i don't know i just kind of feel like piastri needs a good points weekend where he's happy in p10 yeah i'd be very supportive for that and spoiler alert as similar to you i'm hedging my bets here i have mclaren as my highest points of the rest um that's the just you know, could happen, and I don't it think feels like you're... a safe choice. I mean, yeah, not. We don't have to get into the whole conversation of what could happen with Haas Alpha, the Alphas, either of them, and Williams. But just, right. it's not the time. So yeah, McLaren, I think, is the smart pick there. And uh, hey, if... even though I did just call them a dumpster fire. Well, you know what? That says a lot about the rest of the grid at this current moment in time. <laughs> Love you all. <laughs> we definitely have three clear groups. Well, you know what? Let me amend that. We have four clear groups. We have Max Verstappen. We have whatever's going on with Checo that weekend. And then we have the fast. And then we have the slow. Like, yeah. that's kind of what it feels like at this point. McLaren's frustrating because it does feel like they could have the pace of the fast, but just everything. You know what? McLaren and Alpine do kind of deserve to be in the same category like they were all of last season, where it's like, you might have pace, but come on. Get it to be together, fair, they're, please. They're like, I feel like the only teams that have switched, I have to go, that have switched like out of the the bottom of our standings. And I feel like the, they were the only ones that have been like, be able to spice it up at any point. Um, but that's because Pierre crashed into S1 Ocon in Australia. Oh yeah. So, right. so, so they so, never has... on pace deserve to be below McLaren. Pierre just thought it would be great to turn into his teammate. And Pierre will, I have basically no doubt will do something this weekend. Oh boy. To Canada, eh? Everyone announced that starting this season, they're going to be doing a children's-focused broadcast. And what this means is that they're putting out, in collaboration with Sky Group, an alternate broadcast option that is going to make an F1 race more easy to understand, palatable to an all-ages audience. Because F1 can be confusing to new fans. I can... I can only imagine a young five-year-old just being excited about the cars going around, but probably not learning a lot as they discuss the intricacies of whether or not, like, a, like did Yuki Tsunoda deserve a penalty there? Like, there's so much you could do to tailor a race to a younger audience. So I think this is a really great thing they're rolling out. They're also bringing in commentators that are of the age that they're targeting. So they're doing a whole casting call around it. I... Love this idea. I think this is something that is, again, we talk all the time about companies, organizations want to get younger audiences because then you have a customer for so much longer. So 
having kids be interested in Formula One, and maybe it's not because their family or their guardians or anyone in their life is interested in Formula One, but it's just something that is accessible to them, one, and two, presented in a way that is interesting, I find very exciting about the future of the sport. And I just think it's like just really great. I can't imagine just like just seeing a bunch of like younger kids at races because they want to be there and like having a rooting interest and all that type of stuff is so cute and exciting. The interview content we're going to get when they bring in these younger broadcasters and they get to like sit down with Lewis Hamilton and like, interview him, like it's going to be really wholesome. I'm also just a big advocate for more choice in the marketplace. So the more different options you have of where and how to consume the race, I think the better. Because they're not taking away the main feed. If you love Sky Sports' normal broadcasting option, you're still going to have that. But then, like, your friends who have kids, like, might be able to throw this option on for their kids as well. So I, th I think it's, like, you know, all addition and choice is always a win. And this got both of our brains thinking, kind of where they always are. It's not that this got us thinking. Our brains are always thinking about this. If we could add alternate feeds that we could watch F1 through, what would we want them to be? So I'm going to pitch to you some additional choices I would love for us to have. You, I know you have some to pitch to me. The way this is going to work is that we have to do like 60 second elevator pitches. I didn't prep for mine at all. I just wrote down the idea. Let's see how okay, that okay, works. Cool. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and then the other person is going to have to green light the idea, you know, send it back for review or just like completely nix the idea. Like, no, that we're not going to put any of our fake production money <laughs> into that idea. Oh, uh, brain. Okay. Which one do I want to start with? I'm so worried you're going to have one or both of mine because I really like mine in them. Yeah, I'm sitting here like, do I start with the one I'm the most excited about or do I start with the one that I think you're most no. likely to have? Start with the uh, one you're most excited about. Uh, okay, this is kind of a middle ground. I don't know if this is the one I'm personal. This is the one I would be the most excited about for F1 globally, but not the one I, as a F1 viewer, would be the most excited about. And it's that I think F1 should do their version of a Manning cast. Okay, you're about to hear us talk about why F1 should do their version of the Manning cast. This was obviously recorded before F1 announced that they were doing exactly that. But instead of cutting out the footage, we thought that it was such a great explanation as to why this was a good idea and they're doing it and it is still a good idea. So we're leaving in the pitch that we make and then we'll come back afterwards and give you our reactions to uh, it actually happening. And spoiler alert, I think Nicole's a little excited. I have so many feelings. I feel like this is a fever dream. And if you don't watch the NFL, the Manning cast has the two Manning brothers. They sit there and they watch the Monday night football game together and they commentate on it, but they commentate on it from the point of view of a quarterback. So they they teach you a lot. And then they bring in guests and they just goof off. And then like the game could be going on and you just feel like you're sitting on the couch with two of the most famous quarterbacks in NFL history watching the game. I think they should do that for F1. So follow-up questions. Okay. Who are the two people? Is it former drivers? Is it former team principals? Is it, are they related? <laughs> I don't think they need to be related. I think it needs to be um, t a former driver and uh, two former drivers. I think because it's the player deal, but they need to be friends and they need to not currently be broadcasters. So I'm not the best at fan casting for something like this, but like Nico Rosberg, Jensen Button, like they, there's, there's like guys who do this professionally now. That's not what I want. I don't want professional. I want, we are just sitting on a couch, two dudes chilling, watching the race with you. Like that's, I want that level of unhinged. So like, Honestly, it would be um, like 
in as a selfish like i'd want to see seb but i don't think he's unhinged enough for it yeah he's not it would be definitely too professional and Kimmy. talk about real things <laughs> Yeah, I think Kimmy is like a good level of unhinged, but he would need to be with someone he's good friends with to pull out the personality. But again, I'm I'm bad at fan casting these kinds of things, but that's the archetype we need. Like two drivers who are friends who are not currently professionals in the space. Or maybe two podcast co-hosts who... <laughs> that's a different pitch. <laughs> already. <laughs> film themselves. Reflecting. I would love this. I think this would be... I also have like the hot take where I sometimes it, depending on the game enjoy the Manning cast because it's so ridiculous and backwards and wild um, I would love to see F1 lean into that like silliness and already ESPN's like doing this with football so like you want to keep it fancy and fun and bring a new sport <laughs> to it like <laughs> yeah yeah in full transparency I'm not a Manning cast viewer like that, but I like watching Manning cast highlights, like the funny things that happened. But that's because I'm a nerd and I want to see like people break down the plays that I'm watching. Like I don't actually personally love the sitting on the couch with the two former players vibe, but I think it's great television. Like I can understand, not for me, but needs to be an option in F1. Shocked that it's not currently an option for F1. Agreed, agreed. Well, I'm, th I'm throwing my fake money at it because. Woo! There you go, green light. I cannot believe that Daniel Ricardo and Will Arnett are going to be having an alternative broadcast. I like it. I feel like ESPN is in my house and listens to everything I consume, and they're like, "She pays for F1 TV, but look over here." I can't even believe this is happening. <laughs> I can't believe that. A mere 36 hours after we recorded a segment pitching why F1 needs their version of the Manning cast, that they announced it and we held the footage. Like, yeah. Imagine if we dropped this segment that everyone's listening to right now last week and it dropped the same day that this was announced. I really I, like being right. I completely like, okay, so your manifestation powers, I think we need to put to like, <laughs> to use with our knowledge and like really i have like a list of friends slash enemies that like i think we could like manifest some things for and <laughs> but i if we had released that footage i understand that shows take more than eight minutes to like plan especially at the scale of espn but i just would have convinced myself that espn is listening to gridwalk and threw together that whole show and they're like here you go you got you wanted it so bad here it is. <laughs> okay, I realized that we just dove right into our thoughts and feelings about this without outlining what this is. It is Omaha Productions and ESPN. Omaha Productions is the production studio that does the Manning cast that is run by the Manning brothers. They're doing essentially what feels like a trial of three alternate broadcasts for F1 races with Daniel Ricardo and Will, Not Will Arnett, which yes, sounds like a Nicole Katz fever dream. <laughs> if this is, if you're like, wow, who's this show made for? Nicole Katz. <laughs> that, that's who this show's made for. And I want to doing... preface, it's it, like, I, it's not, I love my F1 TV broadcast. I will have multi-viewer open on my computer. So I have all of my stuff open at the exact same time. I, that, I, I do not prefer the ESPN broadcast at all. I do love shenanigans. So both is where <laughs> I will go. Well, this is also the first weekend. So you've yet to watch it to see, like you might end up really liking it, really hating it. We'll see. I, I have, I really think there is little to no chance that you hate it. Maybe it won't be your favorite thing, but I, but um, it will be for the Canadian GP, uh, the US GP, and the Las Vegas GP this year. And I think they're trialing two things. One, they're trialing to see if this broadcast works and if people are going to watch it. And I think, two, Daniel Ricardo is trialing to see if he likes broadcasting. So it's an interesting test. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, so I have unbelievable mixed feelings about it in the sense that, like, if he has too much fun and likes it so much, like, this boy is soft launching a career and commentating right now in, like, a way that is, like, the Daniel Ricardo fashion. And it's like, okay, if he has fun and, like, if, one, this broadcast is any measure of success that ESPN wants it to continue happening and he's enjoying it enough, 
there that's not he I don't see him returning to the grid not like I'm just really trying to like pop my reality bubble of like what I expect to be happening and like that is so what I foresee happening but if he's enjoying himself and if I enjoy the broadcast then like great I get more Daniel Ricardo content than I'm kind of currently getting and with Will Arnett, which, again, if you're new here, I absolutely love everything that has to do with pop culture and, like, anything, and especially when it's related to Formula One. So this is, like, a cro- like crossing paths of two of my favorite things. So very, very hyped to see what this becomes. I'm also someone that enjoyed the, like, disorganized chaos of the Manning cast, especially like when it first started of like, wow, no one knows how to like do a zoom room of this. And I'm just kind of excited to see like a level of that for F1. It's very interesting to see that like the first sport that ESPN chooses to kind of use this template for is F1. I think that's, that's really crazy. And the races are tend to be more popular with us viewers and Daniel Ricardo, us fan base. It makes sense why they're picking these races for this. So we need to roll back. You had, you made so many smart points, but in the middle I'm of I'm sorry. I'm so excited about all of this. No, I don't. I love this. You, you made so many smart points. I want to respond to the smart points, but I need to roll back to the one not smart thing you said in there, and it deserves this. You really think that this is Daniel Ricardo soft launching his media career? That boy soft launched his media career four years ago when he left Red Bull. Like he said, see a Red Bull. I no longer want to be an F1 driver, whether okay. he realized it or not. So maybe that was soft launch. This is full on hard launch. Yes, like, this, this is, is a hard is launch. Official. <laughs> it is here. I have my right. wonderful you know, trendy suit that I wear at the ESPN fancy <laughs> desk and like there's well, so that's yeah. That's what is it gonna be a Zoom? This. Are they gonna be in a studio? Right. What is this gonna be? Are they gonna be on a at couch? the GP? Yeah. Like I'm... I would like I that is that is something I hadn't thought about because I do think that part of the so I'm it, to contrast with Nicole's extreme enthusiasm for this, I'm not a Manning cast watcher with the NFL, like it's not really my thing. I like watching Manning cast highlights afterwards and like seeing the funny shenanigans that went down, but it's just, it's not my preferred viewing method of the NFL. To be fair, she's also an Eagles fan and has something to root for. Well, I am a Jets fan and just (laughs) have to be there. So that's fair. Well, it's also only Monday night. Right. We don't, I I could go off on an NFL tangent for ages. Right. (laughs) But I do think part of the allure of the Manning cast is that it's not well done and that it feels like you're sitting in their living room with them. So I'm intrigued how they transfer this concept over to F1 and do they purposely just say, yep, zoom from your basement. Like, what is... I'm intrigued if that's going to be the vibe, and I hope it is. I want it to be... I want to see Daniel Ricciardo struggle to open a Zoom and, like... It, it needs to have some element of unprofessionalism in order for this to work, in my opinion. I agree. Um, yeah. it, it's what makes it so silly and weird is that you like your con that's what kind of reminds you like, oh, I'm watching two athletes, pop culture individuals. This, I don't however you want to like label F1 driver and Lego Batman are like doing an F1. <laughs> <laughs> broadcast and that's like that potential chaos is what will make it very fun and very different i i will say that what makes me really hesitant about this concept is i think the other thing that i think makes the manning brothers broadcast work is that they are really good friends obviously they're brothers and i i am not convinced of the duo they chose i think daniel ricardo is a no-brainer you have to put daniel ricardo in there I am not super convinced that Daniel Ricardo plus Will Arnett will make that same kind of TV magic, but I hope it does because I want this to work. Even though it's not going to be something I watch, I want this to work. I think it's so exciting when broadcasters do things that are innovative and different, and I like to see ESPN investing in F1, so I want this to work, but I'm... 
a little, I'm more skeptical. I don't know if this has all the right ingredients. I'm keeping my fingers crossed for Will Arnett's improv skills and just like Daniel Ricardo's ability to be able to talk to like a, a wall. But I can definitely see where that's coming from. It was a very surprising choice, I thought. I mean, in some ways I see it with like his involvement with like F1 podcasts and things, but he's also very recent and new, new, however you want to label new as an F1 fan to like the space. So it was a, I felt like a very bold choice in ESPN, a very purposeful. So it will, we'll see a lot this weekend or I'll see you a lot. And I, you know, I will be reporting back to you all of my thoughts and feelings because I, I can't, I am very excited for this. I'm just excited to see how excited you are. Like, I think I'm going to get more text messages about things Daniel Ricardo says this weekend than things that happen on track. Because I just, it's been a while since you've gotten to turn on an F1 race and see Daniel Ricardo. So I'm happy for you. Yeah, and I'm just hoping he's not going to be like decked out in Red Bull gear. So that'll be like a plus if he's in a suit instead of like in a Red Bull polo. Maybe he is and I just have to deal with it. But, you know. All right, what's your first pitch? Okay, so I was trying to lean into like current sponsors and things, mm -hmm. and they've recently re enhanced their deal with Paramount Plus and kind of leaning into like what could be within that domain. So I thought of alternative broadcast options that every race. And there could be like multiple to pick from, whether depending on like your preference and your age range, that the commentators are characters from a Paramount program. So whether you have SpongeBob and Patrick as the commentators for the Spanish Grand Prix, or God, what else is on Paramount Plus all of a sudden? Or the drag queens from RuPaul's Drag Race. Yes, greenlit. <laughs> greenlit. That's it. Yep. <laughs> Please. And you can have multiple broadcasts and they can all just be like different people. And it's like, again, I guess this feels very kind of similar, but not like exactly man and cast with extra guests, but literally the commentators, you can pick the feed yeah. you want and it could be related to a movie that's coming out. It could be just SpongeBob, but I think it would appeal and make it more interesting for the people. You'll be getting the information, but you'll be getting it in a ridiculous voice and a little bit more of a story. I I don't think it's that similar to the Manning cast because there's only so many things you can change about a production to make it unique. I think this is a whole other ball game. It's like fish out of water. Like imagine, like now I'm just imagining a broadcast booth with like the winner of last year's Rule Paul Drag Race, Rule Paul and like Will Buxton. I want that. I want that so badly. Oh that my just God, I want to incredible. see Will Buxton and RuPaul in the same room. Yeah, like, and I actually think it would be incredible. I think he would fully lean into it in, like, yeah. Like, this is, yep, yeah, greenlit. Right, and remember, everyone still has their regular broadcast, so don't worry. Like, people yes. aren't, SpongeBob is going to come in and flip your broadcast upside down, but there's, you know, an alternative. Imagine if he did. Channel. Like, imagine if he I, used okay. the great I would tech. I would love it. Like, I, mean, I just, the fact that we haven't gotten, like, fake slime on, like, a winner at the end, or, like, I just want, like, Spongebob trying to get his boating license to, like, weave. Oh, my gosh. I could talk about Spongebob at F1 integrations for hours. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, I'm glad that we already have broadcast greenlit. So go us. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go with something a little more serious for my next one. And by serious, I mean uh, definitely focused on, like, a specific uh, unit of the current F1 fan base. I'm not talking about slime. Um, I think there should be like a data cast. So I have live timing and I do a lot on my notepad to pull the data and apply it to the race. So for example, like having numbers about your driver and how they're gaining on the person that they're trying to catch or where they are in relation to, like I spent all of the Spanish GP watching Lewis in relation to Carlos because that was the fight. And even if they weren't, like, even if they were a couple of cars away in the beginning of the race, like, I knew that was the fight to watch. So I think there's a lot of great tech where you can integrate that instead of me having six windows open with all the data I need. There can be professionals who integrate that all together and are telling this data story of the race. Things like pit stop windows and, like, where they're going to come out. Like, oh, if Lewis pit now, he would come out here. 
Like, I think there's just little bits of data. And then you get a pair of commentators that are good at doing that stuff on the fly with a group of producers that can feed them information. I think there should be a whole data focused cast. I was like, I, I think like you are needed for this to exist. Like, I think it like it, <laughs> there's it, people it, who are far better than me, but thank you. But like, it just the way that you watch races and how we've discussed like your way of watching things and like the numbers and things and being able to come out of a race or anything and be like, this is what all of this means. And immediately having that right away, like in your brain or like having that in a cast would be so very helpful to people because it's very helpful to me that I basically have that with you (laughs) when it's like numbers (laughs) that I can't be running at the exact same time or where to be looking. I think it would be really educational and great for fans new and old, especially with like new qualifications and like regulations being released that like every year could be a little bit different. Who knows what the circuit Mm -hmm. and things. I would love that as when first becoming a fan, I feel like many people would find that overwhelming but I think there is a good part of the population that would thoroughly enjoy it and gain something from it yeah if there's a children's cast that's focused on bringing young fans into the sport I think we should have some cast options that are focused on long-term nerds (laughs) that's what I'm going with here I love that (laughs) So, yes, I, I throw my money at it because I think the data area of F1 should become more mainstream. I think people get very overwhelmed by it very easily, and I think it can open up new parts of the sport, a new understanding of the sport that, like, not everyone has full grasp on. And see, it's not not that scary. And if we had a data cast, they wouldn't have to do it for themselves like I'm doing now. They instead... Just have someone doing it for them. It's like, oh, that's so cool. Here's the live strategy. Uh, But what is your second pitch? Okay. Um, My second pitch is not from a selfish place at all. Um, And it would have nothing to do with that. I would be considered a uh, content creator in this space. But I think for every race, for pre during brought like during the ra- pre race during the race post race there is a selected online content creator group pairing that is in charge of the fan production that is in charge of what drivers are interviewed what is asked and what is discussed during the race and like can pitch that whole story pitch that whole storyline and it is again a separate broadcast so don't worry you're still going to have that but for people that want more of like an individual fan experience or if there's someone that has a really large fan base and it wants to become like a a watch party in some sense, but giving online creators a little bit more access and ability to develop a storyline in the F1 space. And I know how outlandish that is, but I was dreaming big and obviously in the world of different perspectives on it. So that's my spicy one. I I know you said it's outlandish, but it's the one that we've pitched so far that my brain immediately started churning into, oh, that means we could do this and that means we can do that. And I think an area of opportunity, uh, particularly for long, like races are not short, quick sprints (laughs) to the end. Um, And I think in the way we watch, so I will watch and I'll watch all this data and you'll watch onboards and like all these things. But I also have Twitter open the entire time. And I think there's in every race, even the most boring races, three or four moments where the discussion of the online space shifts in what they're talking about. And just having people involved in a broadcast channel that is more social media and internet focused, where they can in the moment integrate what is being discussed online Oh, okay. Online, they're talking and making funny memes about George Russell's sweat. Oh, let's start showing some of those on the screen. Let's integrate that. Let's have the broadcasters talk about it more because, and share, and just to your point, like making it more of a fan experience and making everyone, because I think the stat is something less than, uh, like a one, less than one percent of F one fans will ever go to an F one race. So I think a separate broadcast to get everyone included all over the globe into what's going on in the broadcast would be 
amazing. And I do think that content creators would be the perfect faces for a broadcast like that. And we talk a lot about, and I love, that's literally the exact kind of like mindset that I was like going for of Mm -hmm. involving the online discourse, because the amount of times that we'll be watching a race and I also have Twitter open and whether it's like seeing what everyone's talking about, or like, I feel like I find out what like the yellow flag was from Twitter before I find out from like a broadcast. And so having like that, it feels so much more current and almost more relevant. And also as everyone hears us talk about a thousand times, that F1 is not just about the fight for the driver's championship or the constructor's championship. There are stories up and down the grid. So having a set of content creators that are able to develop their story throughout the weekend of what that race is, I would love to see because I think coming from that fan perspective and literally that's like what we do every single week is not even create stories, but talk about the ones that are already there and bringing attention to them. And I think it could be really beneficial. And you're already having, you know, coming in with fans or great exposure to find new content creators that way. I would love to see it. And something that what you just said really made me realize, I think for the first time, I don't know why I've never put this together. And I know we compare F1 to the NFL a lot. It's just the other sport we watch the most. But in the NFL... Every single team has dedicated reporters for that team. So there's big global reporters and news outlets, and then there's dedicated, oh, this is the, these are the Eagles beat writers that I follow, essentially. And in F1, that's not really the case. There's just a lot of global reporters, and then there's the Italian press that just loves Ferrari and or hates Ferrari, depending on the week. So... I do think that in addition to what you're saying, I think bringing people in and having dedicated, even just through F1's arm, if you have dedicated people and creators focused on my beat this week is Haas and I'm going to follow the full story of Haas. And then if I was a Haas fan and I knew that Nicole Katz was in the pit lane as the Haas beat reporter this week. And I, if I wanted updates about the Haas story, I check in with Nicole. Like that is something that is really missing in the F1 ecosystem, in my opinion, because then like you get like a fun, like, it, it means that teams like Williams and Haas and these smaller back of the grid teams, their stories don't get so left behind. I'm sure there's just as much going on down there that isn't actually being reported because we have such a limited amount of media outlets and they're only reporting on what they can because there's just only so many people that are F1 reporters. So yeah, I think I think not only is your pitch greenlit, but I think the legs off of your pitch are endless. Yay. Great. Wonderful. I didn't think I could be more excited about an idea that doesn't involve SpongeBob's voice, but you know, never say never. But yeah, I thought that could be really fun and unique and something that I I was just thinking of things that I would want to watch or wish I had. (laughs) Of all the pitches, I want Paramount to sponsor a specific race and I need Max Verstappen to get slimed. I would love it. Although I was always jealous of people that got slimed and I don't want to be jealous of Max. So I'll try to be like, oh, it's gross and not be envious. But slime always looked no, really I just, cool. I just love when the celebrities and the personalities who don't seem to have a great sense of humor or didn't grow up watching SpongeBob have to get slimed. And yeah. that just, Max Verstappen to me reads as a, I don't think he'd have a great sense of humor, which means I would find it funny. I had like an an original broadcast idea where like the radios were like characters voices. And I had like this like vision of like Oscar the Grouch as like Christian Horner and like (laughs) Checo's like cookie monster and like every, like just something like, and I was like, that seems like a little hard to understand. (laughs) That would need like a full like video production like, like we would have to stitch in here, like your pitch separate. I also think before we wrap up the segment, we should share that your godson is Cameron your godson. <laughs> he's not my god. He's my cousin. His sister. Oh, okay. His sister is my goddaughter. Um, but I have a cousin who is seven years old, and he 
is a big Mercedes fan. He likes watching F1, and he watched the Spanish Grand Prix this weekend. So when I was talking to him about, you know, what do you want as an F1 race as a kid, his exact answer was, I want race cars that transform into BB-8. So he needs F1 race cars that are Transformers and Star Wars. And that was the pitch. And I think it's a great idea, except that Disney's not involved <laughs> in this Disney deal. Disney owns ESPN. Disney does. Right. I'm, the, I'm such in a Paramount Plus headspace yeah. that I'm just like, but it was so, he started so serious. I mean, he was serious the whole time, but I was like, oh, oh yes. it's like race cars. But it needed to, and then he's like, it needs to be orange. And I'm like, why, why? And that's when we got the transform into BB-8. Right. So. And I, I thought it was the best pitch. I think his pitch trumps our pitches. I agree. By leaps and bounds. Because I would also love to see F1 cars transform into BB-8. Welcome to Yellow Sector. No, it's not the fastest walk around F1, but we will complete a full lap around the paddock hitting every F1 garage. And welcome to this freaky Friday of me doing Yellow Sector Notes. This is a special Pride Month edition of Yellow Sector Notes, and we are only hitting an F1 garage if they have a Pride Month initiative or do something to be promoting the LGBTQ plus community and inclusivity in F1. So we will first be starting out with Alfa Romeo, who currently for this season has a LGBTQ plus design decal on their car for the month. Thank you for showing your support. Mercedes. So as today, as we are filming this today, it is Tuesday, June 13th, um, Racing Pride, which is a wonderful organization. It's an LGBTQ plus charity that works with the entire motorsports in industry and making it more inclusive for LGBTQ plus individuals and their allies. And they yesterday had a wonderful discussion at the Mercedes factory around bringing pride and allyship to F1 and how everyone can be part of championing the LGBTQ plus inclusion in Formula One. So really cool to be seeing Mercedes be a part of that. They have what I think is the best pride design on their car. And of course, they have their driver, Lewis Hamilton, who is always vocalizing the support for, support for the causes that he cares about. And the pride decal on his helmet is featured at every single race, no matter where the race is. So shout out to Lewis for always vocalizing for what is important and what matters. Red Bull. Red Bull actually is the most recent team to announce a partnership with Racing Pride. Racing Pride has been working with Red Bull behind the scenes for some time, and their ambassadors went to the factory to be a part of the big announcement that happened, and they have returned to the factory numerous times to work on different, to have different workshops on LGBTQ plus topics, terminology, the proper vocabulary to use, how to be a good ally, and how to enhance inclusion in Formula One. Alpine. Very cool. Carrie Sparling, who is their power platform development manager, was actually highlighted on Sky Sports for being an ambassador for Racing Pride and discussing inclusivity in the sport. They also have a really sick design on their car featured this year. They do a lot of things with Racing Pride as well, being at their factory, having different ambassadors come and just have whole different discussion and workshops because educating and being part of the discussion is the first step. Aston Martin, I have to give big kudos because it's not just their Formula One team. That is involved with Racing Pride. It's actually their entire organization as a whole. They have held different discussions across different areas of their business, learning how to be a good ally, all about inclusivity, being there, showing this, uh, showing the support and being vocal about it on social media. Definitely very huge. Something that I think is really cool is Aston Martin and Racing Pride actually have an award for Formula students. It is called the Racing Pride and Aston Martin Diversity and Inclusion Award, awarding young individuals that are trying to come up with initiatives and really passionate about inclusivity and diversity as a whole, not just within LGBTQ plus community, and overall just really focusing on making the motorsports industry a more inclusive place, which is so awesome, investing and shining a spotlight on young individuals wanting to make a difference in F1, and they also want a VIP experience at Silverstone. That's actually the end of our Yellow Sector Notes. We didn't make as many stops this week as we normally do, and that's disappointing, and teams should do better. But that is the grid walk for June 15th, 2023. Actually, my birthday, I just put that together. How was my sector time today, Brianna? <laughs> 
I'm just realizing that non-sick Brianna had like a really fun birthday bit to do for you that we might just do next week. But your sector time <laughs> was much faster than this cold is excavating my system. I'll be back to normal <laughs> next week, I promise. That was totally fine. It was my honor to be able to give you this special edition of Yellow Sector Notes and to really bring attention onto different things that really are important to us as being fans in Formula One. Happy Pride Month, everyone. Thank you to voiceover man. Whatever executive at ESPN completely greenlit the green the grandstand broadcast for this weekend, super hyped about it, if that's not clear already, and our four legged executive producers. Please make sure you have your auto downloads turned on. Really, really cool. Just get it downloaded automatically, and then it'll be there for you no matter what. Rate, review the pod. Let us know what you're liking. What do you enjoy? What would you like to hear us talk about? What would you like to see us celebrate? What silly shenanigans would you like to see us get into? Really, really helps us out for you to leave a review. As always, I say every single week, it takes two seconds for you to make literally probably our entire month, if not our year, of saying something that you like about our show. We really want to improve it. Make sure you follow us on social media, any social media that you use. You can find us at Gridwalk Show, and we will be there for your daily grid walks. And we will be back every Thursday, and we sincerely hope you join us. Oh my gosh, I need some Canadian maple syrup pancakes uh, after that entire grid walk. Go Lance!